open up to the book of Acts. We are in chapter 9, and today we look to uh, continue in Peter's miracle ministries. We're talking about what the Lord had Peter doing, and always for his honor and his glory. Some great stuff has happened thus far, and we'll continue with that today. So we are in part two, and our subtitle is Dorcas is Raised to Life. So let's begin with prayer, and then I'll read our passage this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for letting us raise our voices to you. Thank you that we know you're coming soon. We see what's happening on the world. We can take the temperature, Lord. It's hot out there. It's a world that is angry. It's a world that, uh, gosh, we can't tell from America, Lord, if it's America anymore, Lord. It's crazy with this uh, colleges uprising and all these things going on, Lord. We ask, Lord, that we would be looking towards you, Lord, looking up, keeping oil in our lamp, Lord. And so while we await your coming for us, Lord, in the rapture, we ask, Lord, that you'll speak to us through your word, that you, Holy Spirit, would uh, again quicken us and mature us in you, Lord. Show us something perhaps that we haven't seen or considered before, Lord. Complete us, Lord, that we might be effective tools for you, Lord, during these last days. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Reading from Acts chapter 9, we pick it up in verse 36. <clears throat> Reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples had heard that Peter was there. They sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. And then Peter arose and went with them. And when he had come, they brought him to the upper room. And the, all the widows stood by him, weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all, all out. And knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when, she, and when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known through all, all of Joppa. And many believed on the Lord. So it was when he stayed many days in Joppa. He stayed with Simon A. Tanner. Church, you may be seated at this time. So we have been talking about Peter's miraculous ministry. And we learned last week that, and I asked you the question, what is the greatest thing that God could do for us? And some of us said, well, healing the body. I have a brother right now with cancer. He's going through treatments and whatnot. My brother Isaac, and uh, he's going to be checking into City of Hope. They're going to keep him a while. And uh, he's just not doing well. I wonder, me of little faith, if he'll ever take the pulpit again and preach as a preacher as he was once upon a time. But uh, many of us would say the healing of the body, someone that you know is sick, you know, then dying and, or uh, something like that and pray for them and heal them. So Aeneas, who we talked about last week, uh, eight years he had been paralyzed. And the Lord touched him through Peter and he was able to rise. And many people came to the Lord and there was such a celebration that, with that. Secondly, we talked about, well, what is the greatest thing that God could do? And some of us said, well, one of the greatest things is that of raising someone from the dead. And today we get to look and consider the scripture in front of us as that is what Peter is going to do as we just read, right? And then one more thing. What is the greatest thing that Jesus can do? And some of us said, you know what it is? It's really the salvation of a sinner. Someone that wants nothing to do with the Lord. Someone that has kind of heard about Jesus, the cross. And you know, that's just not for me. But when the Lord reaches that person, there's a change of heart. and There's a change of direction. We say that is the greatest thing that God can do as well. So as we consider Peter's ministries, he's doing all these three. The healing of the body was last week with Aeneas. Today we talk about the raising of the dead, and the next time we're together, we're going to talk about he going out to the Gentiles and sharing and teaching as we continue our study, or our, our consideration of the series, Peter's Miracle Ministry. So, indeed, we are in a 
excellent, excellent part of Scripture. And now, I think, with that little backup, we are ready for the rest of the Scripture. So let's look at verse 36. Have your Bibles open. Don't close them. We want to follow along, right? 36. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which, which is translated Dorcas. Now, this woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. So, church, I'm going to make a couple of observations for, with us, some observations, because I believe it, uh, it enhances our learning as we consider what is going on. So let me take you there. Let me show you the map again. So we see in the middle of the map, it's Lydda, and that's where he, Peter has been at. Uh, that's where he healed Aeneas. And this situation with Tabitha happens in Joppa. Joppa is a seaport village, if you may, and it's about 10 miles from Lydda. It was the, uh, Joppa belonged to the uh, tribe of Dan. Today, modern-day Jaffa, if you may, is what it's called. Now, this is the same place, if you may, where Jonah actually found a ship going to Tarshish, right? He sailed from there instead of Nineveh. Dr. Wearsby makes this observation. Jo Jonah, quote, Jonah went to Joppa to avoid going to the Gentiles at Nineveh, right? But Peter in Joppa received his call to go to the Gentiles. And sure enough, as we get into it in our next time together, we're going to see Peter in Joppa, because that's where he's going to raise Dorcas from. And then all of a sudden, the messengers come from Cornelius to bring, to come. God has spoken to him, and the Lord's doing this work in Peter. How many of you guys know that God works in us while we're still ministering to others, right? God works in us. So we have Peter, right? Full-on Jewish guy has come to the Lord, as we would say, born again. But many of those cultural things that we hang on to, sometimes more than uh, giving them to the Lord, Peter's the kind of guy that has these things going on. So all this time, as we're getting ready, as we're seeing these miracles happen, the Lord is preparing Peter to go out to the Gentile people. And so when we get there, you're going to enjoy it. There's some great stuff, observations that we're going to make. All right, so... It's a contrast, right, as we see here, as Worsby points out. Uh, Peter, uh, Jonah disobeyed God. The Lord sent a storm, if you may, and caused the Gentile sailors to fear. But Peter, who obeys the Lord, God sends the wind of the Spirit. And we're going to see, uh, uh, to the Gentiles, we're going to see a, a great joy and peace come to them. All right, second observation I want you to note is the disciple's name was Tabitha, Right? which is a Hebrew name. It was a good name at the day, in that day. And the Greek for which is Dorcas. Both names signify someone that is dear, someone that is sweet. We all have met Christian couples and we say, oh man, didn't you just enjoy that time with Sister Jones or Brother Bob or whatever? I mean, I could be friends with these guys. This is, they have a real sweet spirit. It's a good uh, time that we had with them. This is the type of woman that she was. Her name uh, uh, characterizes a pleasant creature, right? So it was good name back in the day, but as we say, most likely not today, right? You wouldn't name your little girl uh, Dorcas, because if she had a brother, you'd call him Dork, right? I mean, it just doesn't go well, right? So good name back in the day, but today, uh, maybe not. But I have a little application that jumps from there. Listen, it's an application for you future parents or grandparents if you're suggesting names, right? Uh, you have just one chance to name a child. So pray about it. Pray about it that it's a good name that you're going to give to this kid, right? Give them a good name. In the words of Johnny Cash, don't name him Sue, right? Bill, George, or anything but Sue, right? So we get these kind of things, and Dorcas is the same kind of thing. Great name back in the day, but not today. Anyway, we move on, right? Third observation is that she was a disciples. Now, ladies, I really want to encourage you to be disciples for our Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that you are, but this sometimes is something that we encourage the guys. Be a good disciple and stuff like that. But uh, she is a good example a great example of what a disciple should be, right? She was one that embraced the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. She was baptized. And she was above all, you know, as we see, full of good works. So she did great stuff, right? And charity. 
Charity is another part. Good works is something that you're doing as, as the Lord asks us to bear fruit. We'll talk about that in a second. But charity is something that you're, you're helping out. You're going to the wallet. You're going to share the house. You're going to loan out a truck or a car. This is charity, to be good in these kind of things. And this is who she was. Now, before we go on, let's take a little break from here. Uh, it would be good for you and I to ask ourselves, right, to make our own personal question and ask, am I the kind of person that when I die, when I'm in here in front of Calvary Chapel, either in a casket or my urn is here, and they come to celebrate my life, will they say about me, was I a charitable person? Was I this person? Was I a person that had good works assigned to me? Did I do things for the body of Christ, for my brothers and sisters? Right? So if you take time this week... And look at the mirror of truth. You can't get away from it, right? Am I this person? Because this is something that's good. Someone that we should emulate, you know, kind of do the same things that this lady, Tabitha, was known for. In fact, Jesus said this in John 58. In John 15, verse 8. He said, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Are you bearing this kind of fruit? And it's just something that we have to ask ourselves. Nobody else around. Just take that little walk around the block. You know, take that little drive to see uh, uh, what's left of bare trees here in Montrose because the colors are almost gone, right? But it's something for you and I to do, to always be asking ourselves a question. Are we measuring up to what the Lord asks us to do, to be bearing much fruit? Sometimes we think that bearing much fruit is just for the evangelist, to bring people into the kingdom. And yes, it can be that. But really it's also what are you doing with your life? Are you giving from the much that God has given us? Are you that person? All right, back to chapter, verse, 30, verse 37, right? And we take the first part. But it happened in those days... That she became sick and died. She died. Church, it seems such a loss when useful and active people for the Lord or a church, when they die. I mean, they just die. One never really finds a replacement. And it's not like we're looking for a replacement. But certainly we're praying, oh, Lord, send us a Tabitha. Lord, send us someone like Dorcas to come and, and, and help and fill this need, this void that a good person leaves uh, when they die. But it happens. They do die, right? It's interesting because uh, Job states in his book, the book of Job, chapter 1, verse 21, when he was given the bad news uh, regarding his family, he lost all his kids and wealth. He lost everything. Job reflected and said, The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And we have to have that kind of attitude with the Lord because think about how long Tabitha had been among them, how long you and I have been among our brothers and sisters. You know, we get to the point where if the Lord does not come for us quickly, you know, or in our time, we're going to die. I was telling my kids um, uh, the other day, or maybe it was yesterday, I feel like I'm in the green zone. And she goes, what are you talking about the green zone? Well, I remember when mom was pregnant with you guys, a doctor said, you know, all right, you're in month number six, you're in month number seven being pregnant, eight, and now we reach the nine. You're in the green zone. Any time that water could break and you could have the baby two weeks prior, two weeks after, or whatever, you're in that zone. And I'm telling my kids, I'm in that zone. Not to give a baby, but at 69, the Bible says what? 70 years has been given to man, 80 if he is strong. So I'm telling my kids, I'm in that zone, and I'm ready to go. You know, I'm, I'm just ready for this. There comes a time when we are going to be gone. Prayerfully, it happens today in the rapture of the church. Amen? Now let me take a short time out with you. The rapture of the church. Listen, I said to you two, three, four years ago that our world was going downhill. And I likened it to putting a marble in a big funnel with one out and spinning it. And it spins, and it spins, and it spins, and it's, it's going lower it goes faster, but it never goes backwards. It goes until it's gone. Our world right now is going downhill. The United States right now is going downhill, right? So that was going down through sin and this and that. Uh, that's happening. But have you noticed also the hatred towards the Jewish people? 
all over the world, specifically in our campuses right now, right? We're talking about our, our, all our Ivy League schools, you know, whether it's Stanford, uh, uh, Brown University, all of them, they're all uh, against the Jews. So here's the second marble. Our world is spinning out, but they're throwing on second marble, and here it goes this way. And this one is a hatred for Jewish people, a hatred for them. The Lord said that all will turn against Israel in the last days. Signs that we're looking for. God has allowed you and I to be looking at what's going on to know, we know how it ends, but to realize the scripture is speaking truth to us. Nations that Ezekiel 37, 38 speak about that are coming against Israel are lining up as well, and everybody's hating the country of Israel, right? So I'm telling you, we're living in these days, get ready, the rapture of the church could happen at any time. Keep oil in your lamp, right? Examples like this, well, that was way back then. Yeah, but we still can use a little kindness for others. Kindness towards us and us being kind to others and giving of ourselves to other people. That's what we, we're supposed to be doing. All right, so second part of verse 37 states, when they had washed her, so she's dead. Dorcas, Tabitha died, and so they washed the body. When my mother-in-law passed away on July 30th, uh, uh, hospice was there. They pronounced her dead, if you may. And then uh, uh, she said to us, well, I'm going to go ahead and wash the body. And I thought about that, and I said, oh, man, it's like the Middle East. I, thought, oh, I never knew they washed bodies when they die. I thought, you know, whatever. But it uh, shows you a little I know about, uh, about that. But they washed mother-in-law's body. They washed the body, and it's telling you, last bath, you know, the body, uh, she's gone. Her soul is gone. The body is there, and we're going to make preparations for her burial burial so when they had washed her they laid her in an upper room so not ring a bell upper room right jesus and disciples as we celebrated communion today were in an upper room after the resurrections christians got together and they they got together in an upper room here there are um, many commentators that believe that this upper room was where the christians met in this town Right? It's an upper room. It's the place, a glorious place, where you come and, and, and commit the soul to the Lord. And so here it is, right? Up in their upper room. So her friends and those around her uh, did not bury her. Then this is unusual, right? Because they had heard, right, that the apostle Peter was close by in Lydda, right? In Lydda, as we learned last week. And they hoped that he would come. That he would come and actually raise her to life. But they washed the dead body according to the custom after trying the usual methods to bring her back to life. But they couldn't. She was dead. Think about us today. Oh, Ben passed away or Ben fell or, or he's, we think he's dead. What do you do? Call 911, right? And, and if the kids are around, dad, dad, dad. You're breaking my ribs if I could talk, right? But I'm not saying anything. You know, they're trying to bring me back to life. And here comes the ambulance. And we've all seen the movies. They get them in the ambulance. What do you think? I think we know how to shock them. So they get the paddles on. Clear, clear. Pow, right? Everyone tries to bring the body back to life. That is a natural thing for us to do. It's the right thing for us to do, right? So... When they're washing the body, she's dead, she's gone. But we do the same kind of things that anyone else would do. For Tabitha, here in the scripture, after washing the body, they laid her in her grave clothes, right? They laid her out in her grave clothes in this upper room. And as I said, you know, people are, are hope, they're not burying her. They're hoping that Pete would come to Joppa, right? Now, one has to admire, right? One has to admire that um, people are, are still having this hope. They have this faith, right? Uh, they're trying to hold off the burial until they've exhausted every, every possibility. So they're saying, you know, maybe Pete's going to come by. We don't know. And let me just share this. One never reads in the book of Acts that any of the apostles raised a dead person. Not in the book of Acts. You're not going to find it, right? So their sending for Peter was evidence of their faith that they now had in the risen Lord. The Lord's not there, but, you know, he's in heaven, right? Now think about it, church. Did not Jesus raise the dead while he was on earth? Absolutely so. For those of you that don't know that, right? So some of them 
must have reason. They must have reason. Why would Jesus not be able to raise the dead from his home in glory? Why not? Why couldn't he do that? He's alive. Let me just take a short time out there, take you down this trail before we move on. It's just a reminder from Jesus. He commanded us to love one another. One of your characteristics as a Christian should be one that has love for other people, right? Love one another. So I say that to say this. Let's not wait to express our love to the people that you want to who are still alive. Mañana is not yours. It's just not yours. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So the Lord says, huh, love one another because he knows the void that you're going to fill. I, I have been to many a funeral. I have been to many a, a emergency room where dad or mom is gone or a child is gone. And I always hear, coulda, shoulda, woulda, but didn't. Right? Don't be one of those coulda, shoulda, woulda. Express your love to your loved ones, to your friends when they are alive. All right. Back to the scripture. Verse 38. And since Lydda was near Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. So let's make some observations here. It's too easy to go by this, right? Number one, Tabitha's friends, praise the Lord, did not run into a roadblock where they had to make an appointment to see the big guy, Peter, right? And, and that's why I say it, it's a roadblock. If you've ever tried to get a hold of the VA or anything like that, when you're in a time of need, they're going to tell you, okay, no problem. What's the problem with my heart? It hurts real bad. I'm hurting real bad. Okay, uh, we, got, we, could get a, we could get you in in about two months. That's a roadblock, right? But that's our VA. Unfortunately, across America, that's exactly how it is. It's not like they don't try. I don't know their administrative nightmares they go through or whatever, but I do know this. We called. Mom was fell, having heart issues and all this stuff. Judy's desperately on the phone. Okay, I want to go through the process. Uh, I'm calling the VA, and the VA tells her, hey, listen, we can see her sometime in January. You know, she looks at me, hangs up the phone, then tears are coming down her eyes because we run into roadblocks. That's just the way it is. Lord, help us with that, right? But I'm glad that Tabitha's friends didn't run into a roadblock to see Peter. He didn't have his entourage. Oh, hold on there, little one. Uh, Pete's the big guy. He's busy. Or have you seen the, uh, the, I forget the name of that series that's going on. Pete's a short guy in that movie. Uh, but anyway, the point is this. As a Christian, make yourself available to people. Someone comes and calls you, make yourself available. I am embarrassed of some of my friends here in Montrose that are in the ministry as pastors that will not give out their personal cell numbers to the fellowship. And they asked me, why do you give out your phone? I said, I put it on the cards. I'll put it anywhere. Because I want to be available, right? God called us to a ministry. We should be available 24-7. My kids were raised that dad gets a call and someone's hurting. I'll catch up with you later, kids. And I take off and I take care of needs. In the middle of supper, we did that for years. But what happens on the other side? When we're not on call and this and that, kids, we're going to Disneyland. We're going to the beach. We're going to dinner. We're going to this and that. Try to keep things balanced because too many kids hate the ministry because their parents are never around and never balance it. So I used to spoil my kids rotten whenever I could to, because I was gone. Daddy wasn't always there with them when these things come. Again, to the point, make yourself available to other Christians. You are the ministers. If someone calls you, you're probably the closest thing to Jesus that they'll ever find. So be ready to respond. I love that about Peter, that there was no gatekeepers there, no roadblocks. Uh, secondly, second observation from here, as they saw him, they shared the bad news along with the fact that they had not buried her. Peter has two ears, so he's hearing, okay, she was a great person. Oh, and she died. Oh, man, I'm sorry, guys. And the second part is we haven't buried her. What? Jewish custom? Three days? You're in the ground. You know, you don't keep people around like we do, Americans. Well, she died last week, but in two weeks we're going to have a service. What do we do with them? Freeze them. Keep them in the cool, whatever. You know, Americans, we're, we are a strange lot, right? But for them, Middle Eastern customs was they would bury them as soon as possible. And that's really all over the world except probably us in England. We're the only ones that don't do that, all right? So they shared the bad news with him. They had not buried her. So Peter, who had hung out with Jesus... Of course, those three and a half years 
kind of hung up with Matthew, the accountant, right, as well. Matthew, fisherman, but he knew uh, for three years. They knew their math. They, they knew it. He knew that Lazarus had been raised on the fourth day, fourth day, and that was a lot of B.O. Peter knew that, right, on the fourth day when he was resurrected. So Tabitha's friends, follow this, are imploring him. Another word for implore is they're begging him. Pete, get down here, right? They beg him to come with them with all speed, not to attend the funeral, right? But if might be to prevent it. Matthew Henry puts in that note. I love that. You know, you're reading it down there. Whoa, to prevent the funeral, get down here, right? So we come to our third observation. It is okay to ask for help. Ask for help. Someone perhaps has mentored you as a Christian and they have a need. It's okay if you can't help them to ask somebody else for help, right? Perhaps they just might have a little bit more faith than you do. Now, raise your hand if you know someone that you think has a little bit more faith than you do, right? We all know someone that we think when it gets to the nitty-gritty, uh, I'm going to ask him because I know he's with Jesus, you know, or close to Jesus. They have a little bit more faith than I do. And so that happens. Listen, I want to share with you an account that happened. Um, my brother Isaac uh, is not doing well now, right now, but was a minister, right, as well. My brother Isaac shared with me that a while ago, uh, their church had planned an activity in Huntington Beach many years ago. Plan planned an activity in Huntington Beach in Southern California. And so the church went out. And uh, he was there. And while they were there, he was walking and spending a little time, a little one-on-one -on -one time with a new convert that had just come to the Lord. It had been a week or two. This new brother had come to the Lord. And so he wanted to do as most people do. He said, what's the church doing? We're having a picnic next week at the beach. Come. Yeah, I'm going to be there. So they showed up. And now he's spending a little time and time. And they're walking along the beach. When, lo and behold, they noticed uh, two guys out on the waves on boogie boards. And if you've ever been to H if you've ever been to Huntington Beach, it, it can, the waves can get crazy out there, right, in Southern California. So they're noticing these guys, and there's a guy, like, almost in between them from their view from the sand and walking on the beach to where these guys are. And this guy, the third guy, did not have a boogie board, and it looked like he was struggling. And so as they talked and they looked up, all of a sudden the guy disappears. They don't see the guy. So my brother and, and this new convert are looking out there, and, and they say, let's go. And so they jump, they run into the water, you know, hit the first wave, go and swim out towards these guys. And when they get to the guys on the boogie boards, they say, hey, where's your friend? Where's your friend? We don't see him anymore. And they turn around and said to him, he, he's not our friend, and we did see someone, but we don't see him. As they're talking, Isaac and, and the new convert are kind of treading a little bit water, but they look, and there's the guy's body floating underwater, about two feet under them. And as hair goes with, uh, with the currents of the water, hair's, hair's moving so they know he's out. So they grab him, they start pulling him out, and they're struggling to get him out, but they bring him out to the shore. And as they get to the shore, of course, there's a crowd that's gathered. A crowd is gathered around him, and here comes the lifeguards. In Huntington Beach, they have lifeguards, you know, posted and whatnot. So they're coming out, and they get to the guy. Uh, they lay him down, and the guy's lifeless body is just there on the sand, on the sand. So the lifeguards start doing their thing. They're, they're pumping him, trying to get his heart going, pumping him, pumping him, nothing. Pumping, pumping, nothing. Isaac said that it seems like almost 10 minutes had gone by, you know, and they finally stopped. And they told the crowd that was in him, he's dead. He drowned. The guy drowned. The new convert turns around and says, Pastor Isaac, we should pray for him. My brother Isaac is, the lifeguards just said he's dead. He said, yeah, but Pastor Isaac, we should, we should pray for him, right? The new convert insisted that they should pray over him. So until so my brother Isaac, the pastor, he tells me, I, I asked sheepishly. You know, I was kind of like, you know, there's a crowd there. The guy's dead. They just pronounced him dead. But this new convert, this guy's just, Isaac, Isaac, we should pray for him. We should pray for him, right? So he says, I asked sheepishly permission, permission from the lifeguards. Is it okay if I pray over him? The lifeguards turned around and kind of smirked at him. He said, he's dead. What are you going to do? Go ahead and pray for him. So Isaac starts praying over the, the body. Lord, tough day for this guy, da, 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 da. But, Lord, if you can have mercy. And the new convert, in the name of Jesus. And everybody, you know, whatever, you know, in the name of Jesus, right? Isaac, kind of like shock, almost wants to say, you know, there's people here. 
The guy said, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. As they prayed, the guy body comes to life, starts choking, spitting out, Ugh, water, sand, all this stuff. And everybody's like that. And the lifeguards turn around. They go immediately, turn the body around, finish it up. The guy survived. The guy survived. Isaac tells me, I will never forget that experience. I, of little faith, the pastor, this new convert, has a faith. God just saved him. He's on fire. He knows what God could do. Starts saying, in the name of Jesus. And this guy comes to life. Oh, my word. So I say this to you. As these guys go up and say, Pete, Pete, our friend Tabitha just passed away, man. But, you know, we, we, I don't know what it is with us. We've got a little faith that if you come down, we just heard that you healed Aeneas. Eight years he was paralyzed and you prayed for him and he walked. Would you just come and pray for him? So, yeah, someone can come that has a little bit more faith than I, you and I do. And we can't shy away from him. Let him go. Man, if someone's exercising their faith, you're with them, let them go. You know, let them do it. You follow along, you're going to learn something. You know, my brother said, can't believe it. Never doubt people's faith. Last observation from this verse. So here it's okay. And, and yes, perhaps necessary to implore. That is to beg someone to come with you. They begged Peter to come. Verse 39. Then Peter arose and went with them. And when he had come, they brought him to the upper room. And all the widows stood by, and they're weeping as we read. They're showing the tunics and the garments uh, which Dorcas had made while she was still with them. She had done all these things. So church, observe that the people are there showing, again, what Dorcas, what Tabitha, Tabitha, Tabitha had made with her hands. And I think this is important because sometimes we think, that to be benevolent, we have to have a healthy wallet. We should have money on the bank, and that's the only way we will be benevolent. When I'll give you of my surplus. No. Uh, some of us, and I want to thank you guys for, for this. We have a mills ministry here in the church. Every once in a while, one of us goes down, and we just can't fend for ourselves. And I love it that when we put out the call to those people that have signed up, include me in your mills ministry, you guys go and you prepare a meal for someone. And it's like you're preparing a meal for Jesus. If it was the Lord Jesus that came and tapped on your door and said, do you have anything to eat? You know, we would, <laughs> of course, do we have anything to eat? Well, some of you guys do that. And that's working with your hands. That's being like a, uh, the work of Tabitha. The Lord accepted her work. She'll accept your work as we do that. I want to encourage you, while you can, make yourself a part of the church and, and get involved in doing things. Start doing these kind of things as she did. So thank you for the Mills ministry. I appreciate you guys. But again, I, I bring it to your attention because it doesn't mean that you have to have money. It's great for some of you guys, and some of you guys have. Even for our Hallelujah Night, you know, someone came, you know, gave us 100 bucks. You know, another one came and gave us this and that. They don't even come to the church. But have you bought candy lately? <laughs> it's like, but going out. Everything is so expensive. You know, our church put together, and it was, a, you know, a $1,000 plus dollars that we bought candy after everything you brought in. So that when people get here, we, we give it out, and they're happy, and they're, it's the best time they've ever had in Jesus. You know, it's a good thing. Um, uh, so it's just a good thing. So it was a good work. So this gathering of friends, you know, and um, they talk about Tabitha's good work. And this is a great thing. She obviously was a seamstress. Uh, she worked with her hands, did all this good stuff. Uh, back then, remember, there was no welfare system. There was no welfare system. In those days, you didn't go to Health and Human Services, right? Uh, widows in the day, orphans back in the day, they had to depend on their own acquaintances for assistance. And today, people depend on the church. That's why we do what we were supposed to do. We tithe, we give offerings, we help out wherever it is that we can so that these people don't get to. Have you ever tried to go get food stamps? Your family's starving, and they say, you know, fill out this application. Good. Now fill out this one. This was in triplicate copies. Sign hard, you know, and we'll get back to you in two weeks or three weeks. Your family's starving for crying out loud, right? So that's why we do what we do, and we're supposed to do it. We're supposed to take care of those in the church that need that help. Verse 40, look at your Bible. But, so they come, they show them all this stuff, but Peter put them all out. And he probably thanked him, man, thanks for this. Now, would you guys mind going out the door, please? Why? He has an experience. He has been with Jesus through years, so he puts them all out, if you may. 
And he knelt down, the Bible says, look at your word, and he prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Now, church, Peter, again, most likely remembered the account when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter. And in both cases, the mourning people were put out of the room. And so he followed Jesus' example. How many of you guys know it's a good thing to follow Jesus' example? Amen. It's a good thing. Now, if you remember the words spoken by Jesus and Peter, they're almost identical. Peter says, Tabitha, arise. Arise. In church, it's important to know, again, that in both cases, in both of these cases, it was the power of God that raised the person from the dead. How do you know this? Dead people cannot exercise faith. They're dead. They can't. It's God working a miracle through you. So, and now I'll tell you this. If the Lord does a great miracle like this, right, where no one can say it's anyone else, the, the new convert looking at hearing the lifeguards, my brother, and stuff like that, only God can do that kind of miracle. Jesus raising Jairus' daughter when the mourners are out there that were already playing music, right? And Peter now raising up Tabitha, who they've come to him, and he's trekked the 10 miles to get, get to uh, Jaffa to where he's at, or where they're at. It's the Lord that does that. So if the Lord does something like that and uses you as the tool, don't you dare be like these TBM preachers and go out there and write a book. I did this. I did that. You know, God deserves the glory. No human being deserves the glory. Yeah. And some of the guys are out there writing, I spent 14 minutes in hell. Nobody has spent 14 minutes in hell and come back to talk to you about it. Only the guys that want to make money. There are wolves and sheep clothing out there. Be careful, be careful, be careful. If they're not giving God the glory, there's something wrong with this picture. Only the Lord can do these kind of miracles. Everyone else... I'm sorry, they're playing a the game. Authors write books to make money. Crazy Christians use experiences to make money. If you got two feet on the ground and you're walking straight and you're in your word, you give God the glory for everything. He deserves the God. Don't you dare rob him from that. You're not nobody. You're just a guy like Peter and a guy like, like anybody else. You know, we're all at the foot of the cross, sinners saved by grace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not out there trying to make money. You shouldn't be. If you're in a church like that, run. Okay, not for you. Okay, so he did this. Then he gave her his hand. He lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. 42, and it became known throughout all of Joppa, and here it is, and many believed on the Lord. That's the purpose and reason for miracles, to bring people to the Lord, that they come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. So just as it happened when Ananias was healed, right, the raising of Tabitha, Dorcas, attracted all sorts of attention. How could it not? Really, how could it not, right? And the results likewise ended with Many people believing in the Lord. That's what it's all about. Verse 43. So it was when he stayed many days in Joppa with so it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon a tanner. A tanner? A tanner. So some last observations for us and some applications. Number one, that he stayed many days in Joppa was a good thing. Right? Because new believers, the many that came to believe on the Lord, needed to be grounded in the truth of the word. Right? Church, faith built on miracles uh, alone, it's, it's going to be shallow. It's a shallow experience just on miracles alone. Right? It's not substantial. So, application. Right? When believers come, we should have, and we do have here at Calvary Chapel, praise the Lord, Kind of like a disciple, uh, a disciple fellowship class or a disciple learning class. Uh, as Peter did, so does for, our, they're not here right now, but Scott and Jenny Hartman, they were here in first service. Uh, they could help you become grounded in the word of God, the Bible, right? 
uh, it behooves you to find out about these classes and enroll. Listen, you're not too old. I was an assistant pastor at Calvary Chapel Vista, and I had never been to a discipleship class. I'd been exposed to many things, but I never really had taken the eight weeks, nine weeks, and sat through a discipleship class. And at Vista, I had that opportunity, and I enrolled. And the other pastor said, you've never been to the, uh, sir, no, I've never been to a discipleship class. So I got my little book, right, by the navigators and showed me the helm of uh, salvation and grace and peace and all this stuff. I loved it. I knew it. It's not that I hadn't been exposed to it, but it never had been in an order where I'm saying, oh, my goodness, it's a little bit deeper. And I loved it. So I want to encourage you guys. It's your duty. You know, if there's a church that offers a discipleship class, enroll. What's eight, nine weeks of your time? The Lord had Peter stay in Jaffa, Jaffa for a while. So the many that came to the Lord, he's able not to answer questions. He's made himself available. Now, what about this and what about that? Jesus said, it's a great time for Christians to grow in the word. Now, I made a point, and I think you saw it here. It said, Simon a tanner. What's the big deal about that? A tanner? It's the Jewish guy, right? Do you remember Leviticus, what it said about, and if you happen to touch a piece of a carcass of a, you know, you go hunting and you go out there and try to quarter your, dude, you are unclean. So you got to come back and get clean, right? If you happen to be at Walmart and some guy comes up to you that's not a Jewish guy, hey, man, did you hear, oh, touch me? I got to go home and bathe, you know. Why is he, why does the Lord mention a tanner? You know why? God is doing a work with Peter. Peter is called to take the word to the Gentiles. God has to do a, a freedom work in Peter to get him ready, right? To get him ready to start dealing with the Gentiles, non-Jewish people. And so God, he has a sense of humor for sure, but everything God does is not just to do it. He has a purpose for everything he does. You find yourself in a weird situation, give it a second thought. What's going on here, Lord? My car broke down in the middle of nowhere. What is going on? And all of a sudden, you see a mountain man, Jim, coming out of the, you know, the desert. Hey, can you help me? And you, you need to be thinking, well, why is my car stuck here? Of course I can do. What do you need? No, first of all, do you have a little water? You happen to have your water. You knew where you were going. God does things for a reason. Before you know it, he's talking, you're talking, and you're talking about Jesus, and you lead him to the Lord. And then here comes a tow truck. I could give you a ride or fix your tire or whatever, and you're on Kick back and think about it. God has allowed circumstances to happen to us, perhaps not favorable for us at the time, but keep your antennas up. You never know what the Lord's going to use you for, and you want to be used by the Lord Jesus. God used a tanner. Peter goes to that tanner's house, and, I mean, it's like every 10 minutes he's washing his hands because there's skins, there's animals, there's this and that. Dead in a tanner's house, right? God is getting Peter ready to be used to go to the Gentiles. Chapter 10 begins with the Gentiles. Remember? Greatest miracle ever. Oh, the healing of the body, man. That is something great. What about you? No, I think raising the dead is the next greatest thing or the greatest thing. And the third opinion, getting people to give their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. We were dead. Can't work faith when you're dead. We were dead in our trespasses, in our sins, when Jesus, the light, spoke to us and our heart responded and we accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. That has to be the greatest of all things. Chapter 10 begins with Cornelius, a Gentile, sending for Peter at Joppa to come over. Great, great part of Scripture. So as we get ready to close, I'm going to ask our prayer team to come up and our worship team to come up. If you are here today... You're listening on radio. You're watching through our social media platform. If you are here today and you don't know this Jesus, this Jesus of whom Tabitha's friend said, go get Peter. If you don't, because he knew Jesus. If you don't know this Jesus, right, whom my brother's friend, the new convert, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, if you don't know this Jesus and have never invited him to come into your heart, what in the world is keeping you as you see our world messed up. The Lord could come at any time now and we're going to be gone. America does not have a voice in the last days. America is not mentioned in scripture. 
all eyes and prophecy focused on the Middle East, not us. Have you asked the Lord to save you? Have you taken care of the sin issue in your life? If you die today, the next ambulance that we hear, the next siren that we hear, if it's for you, if you die today, do you know for certain that you're going to heaven? Do you know? Because if you don't know, today you could be sure. By inviting the Lord Jesus to come into your heart. So I want to give you that opportunity as I look across. Is there anyone here that would say, Pastor Ben, I can't remember giving my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I grew up in a Christian home. I speak Christianese. I could say, God bless you. But when I look and I think about it, I don't remember asking Jesus to come into my life. Asking Jesus to forgive me of my sins. I, I just can't remember. If that's you today, what would keep you from asking him today, from making sure? Come on up. I want to pray for you. Anyone at all. I don't want you to leave Calvary Chapel and say, no one ever extended an invitation for me to come to meet the Lord. No one ever called me out. Listen, the Lord is calling you. Today is your day for salvation. Tomorrow, no guarantees. You know how many millions of people have entered through our southern borders that are not Hispanic or Canadian? There's millions that are in our country. And these ayatollahs and all this stuff are saying, wait till you see America. We don't take the threat serious until a 9-11 happens. You think it's not going to happen in your town until, like this guy in Maine, went nutso and shot 30 people to death. Do you know for sure that if you die today, you're going to heaven? If you don't know... I want to pray for you. I want to give you a chance. Don't get up there and say, ah, coulda, woulda, shoulda, but you didn't. Anyone at all. Well, I've done my part. If you haven't done yours, hey, this is what the Lord says. If you deny me before men, in other words, if you're embarrassed because the guy on the left or the gal on the right is looking at you, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father and the holy angels. That's what he says. But if you confess me before men, I will confess your name before my Father and the holy angels. Do you understand what that means? Have you ever been to court? In court, you come up before the judge and before they start speaking in heaven, if you come up, Jesus said, he's mine. She's mine. She gave her life to us. Dad, they're ours. You're dismissed from court. Enter into my rest. But if you don't know the Lord, you will be tried and you will be found wanting. You'll be found short of the mark. You can't make it on your own without Jesus Christ. You need him to wash your sins away. You need him to cleanse you and to write your name down in his book of life. Anybody at all? All right. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for this miracle that happened back in the day, Lord, over Dorcas' body, Lord. We thank you that Brother Pete made himself available, Lord extended himself, Lord, and came and prayed as you prayed over Jairus' daughter, Lord. We thank you, Lord, because you saved us, Lord. And now I ask, Lord, for our body here, Lord, our church body, that we might remain faithful to you, Lord, that we might be looking up for your coming as soon. Grant us, Lord, the days that you have for us, Lord, but help us to be looking at ourselves in a mirror, Lord, and, and doing the things you called us to do. Help us not to be playing church, Lord, but to be ready for your coming. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.